Hey guys. When they gave me this topic, it's not you, I immediately thought of that weasel line that people use to get out of relationships with people they no longer love. It's not you, it's, it's, it's me. And I thought, fuck that, I'm not gonna do that. The you that I decided to talk about is not the external you. It's rather the you that you address yourself as, the you that that tiny voice in you, the voice that's perhaps most true, says when you're fucking up or doing something wrong or untrue to yourself. That thing that hides and says, this isn't you. And to talk about this, I'm gonna bring you back to that terrible, terrible time in all of our lives that's known as middle school. <laughs> like many people here, most who are saying, I hated myself in middle school. And so to assuage this hatred of myself, this thing in me that said, this, this is not you, this is not you, this is not you, I turned to idols, and one of my idols was an artist from 1890s Paris known as Toulouse-Lautrec. Toulouse-Lautrec was the star artist of the Moulin Rouge, the fanciest nightclub in all of Paris. He was about the same height as I am without heels. He was a syphilitic little person who went slowly insane, probably because of uh, aristocratic inbreeding. He was also addicted to absinthe. But he drew with a cutting scathingness that showed the can-can girls of the Moulin Rouge not just as pretty tarts, but as class warriors. His main muse was a woman called La Goulou. Now, La Goulou's mom was a laundress, and she was destined for nothing in her life so much as a lot of drudgery, except with sheer grit and athleticism, she got to be the queen of that nightclub. And there's a story about her, that one day she's performing, and the Prince of Wales was sitting right where you're sitting, and she went up to him and she kicked his hat off of his head. And with this gesture, she said, all right, motherfucker, you might be the guy who is destined to be king in the world, but in here, I am queen. So I was obsessed with these two figures. I was so obsessed that I even, for my 11-year-old uh, art class project, created a diorama where I made little clumsy, badly done to lose the track with a little bottle of absinthe and his little sketch pad and little Lagaloo, you know, kicking her leg, and her leg broke uh, midway through the presentation of these because I wasn't so good at craft. But all I would have given in the world was to have put myself inside that diorama, to have sat there, like to lose the trek with my sketch pad, sketching all of the pretty girls and winning the love of all of those people that I idolized. All I would have given was to have been able to look at myself and said, this is you, this is you after all. So let's fast forward. It's 2008. And it is at the height of the financial boom years in New York. New York City is exploding into a mass of glitter and gentrification and money and depraved deals where bankers were selling mathematical algorithms as if they're related to anything real on earth. And everything in the world was churning in this sort of Gnostic miasma of cash, cash, cash. And in this time, it had its own Moulin Rouge, just as 1890s Paris did. It's called The Box. And I would have given anything to have chronicled it. A lot of my friends from the burlesque scene were performing at The Box. I had danced burlesque badly myself, but I had done it in part because I wanted to hang out with these men and women who were as tough and glittering and sharp as diamonds. And Dancing seemed like the best way until I was able to draw well enough for that to be the bribe that I could exchange for their acquiescence to some friendship. So all of these people were performing there. And it was an amazing thing because you had the best performers in the world on stage here. You had the acrobats, you had the beautiful porn stars and the opera singers, the contortionists. You had the most talented people in the entire world. And they were performing for fucking pigs. It was girls before swine. They were performing for the guys that wrecked the economy every single night. It was the place where the classes rubbed up against each other right until they bled in this frenzy of desire and fury and rage. And it was Moulin Rouge. This was the place where La Goulou would have been performing. This was the diorama box that I had done when I was 11 years old. And all I wanted to do was be inside it and say, this is you. My friend Buck Angel was a star performer there. Buck is a trans man and a porn star. He looks like 240 pounds of tattooed beefcake hell's angel with Irish boy tattooed across his back. And one night he invited me by. I come in and boom, through the smoke, the illegal smoke, mind you, and the blue 
lights, I see Buck on stage like some paragon of Victorian masculinity. He's wearing a striped unitard like a strong man, girls swooning at his feet. He's stubbing out a cigar in his tongue. And then he rips off the unitard and he thrusts his pussy at the audience with all of the swagger of any Puerto Rican relative that I had, but they had, they had been entitled to it from birth because their moms all told them they were princes and he had earned that shit. And I looked at it and I thought this was the most beautiful place I had ever seen in my life. And so I started drawing like I always do, because I'm too socially awkward to make friends. And so I'm drawing and the nightclub owner goes up to me and he says one of those things that sounds like a scripted movie line, but I assure you it happened. He says, hey, we always wanted our own to lose the track. And I looked into his eyes and I thought, this is me, this is you. For years, I sat on the corner of that stage at the box during those, those days when money surged so boiling high in New York that it drove out every other value and every other person. I drew Rudy Makaji as he did a backflip over a chainsaw, catching himself minutes before his head met the blade on a trapeze that was hung six inches, too high for him to die. I drew contortionist porn stars on liras above the bar, snatching drinks out of people's hands. I drew one night, Rose Wood. Rose is a, she's a trans woman. She's a performer who got her chops as a performer, working in the really dirty, great gay bars that made New York fabulous. And she, in addition to everything else, the thing that always stands out to me about Rose is an artist. She has this look of cold and contemptuous dignity on her face. It is a dignity that is beautiful and impenetrable and shockingly, shockingly complete. Rose's dignity is so perfect that she could be opening up a beer bottle with her asshole and she still looks at you like, motherfucker, you are the one in this situation who is demeaned. So Rose Wood came up on stage and she was dressed like a cartoon of a sex worker, a little like spandex outfit, loose side heels. And then there's a guy who's dressed like an audience member, he's dressed like a banker. And the MC starts narrating the guy's thoughts. And they go, oh wow, I'm such a dirty boy. No one would ever think that I would hire a prostitute who knows me at work, but I'm so much cooler than they think I am. And uh, she leads him over to a coat rack and she undresses him very carefully. Uh, she hangs up his suit very nicely. And he thinks, oh, she's not like my bitch wife. She cares about me. Rose takes him over to the bed. She handcuffs him, and he thinks, oh, kinky. She um, pulls up her dress. He thinks, oh, she has a dick. Oh, she's gorgeous anyway, who the fuck cares? And so Rose, Rose makes love to him on the bed, and it's beautiful and sad and gorgeous and everything. And then she gets off, she lies in there, stupid with satiation. She smokes a cigarette. Then she pulls out a knife. She hides it behind her back, not very well, but he is dumb with satisfaction. She goes to the bed, straddles him, and he thinks, oh, I'm so fucking good, she came back for seconds. And then she pulls out the knife. And you can see this moment of shock on what you see of his face where he thinks, Did, weren't we friends? And then she just brings it down, and the lights grow to strobe. And in that flash of blood and, and light and shadow, Rose looks ecstatic. She gets off the bed pulls off the dress, she pulls off her wig, she's bald, and she stands and looks at the audience with this look of such perfect, contemptuous dignity that it says, motherfucker, it was you that I stabbed in that bed. And then she puts on his suit. She lights a cigarette, she throws the lighter on the bed, burns, banker and all. And then in that class drag, Rose walked off the stage. About a week after I saw this act, the inevitable happened. The New York Stock Exchange crashed, and my boss was one of the people ringing the bell. New York had been like a bubble was the moment before it bursts, when it's all colors and so shiny, and all you could see is your own reflections. But now all of that money was temporarily gone. Decadence was out of fashion. The CEO of Lehman Brothers was punched in the face while he was working out at the gym, probably by one of his own coworkers. And there were 10 cities growing outside of Las Vegas. Doctors Without Borders was treating people here because 
we don't have a dignified health insurance system. And everything had come crashing down. All of those lies and all of that delusion and all of that Gnostic math had finally come to its absolute crashing end. And while the people, those patrons at the box who had been the architects of this collapse were all getting fat on bailout money, the wealth didn't come back for anyone else. And still I would sit there, even though it was much more chastened and much more sober at the box and they were firing people right and left, and I would think, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to us sell-out artists, people? What's going to happen to us sparklers illuminating the face of the destroyer? What do we do now? Fast forward. It's 2010. The money's come back to this top like it always does in this country, and people are coming back to the box. And they've even opened up a branch in London. It's winter. A young guy who sell, sold fruit in a town in Tunisia had just burnt himself alive because... It had been one too many times that the police were shaking him down for bribes and destroying his stuff. The world was starting to burn. And I had just gotten a job to paint pigs at Nero's nightclub. The box was opening up a branch in London, and they asked me to uh, decorate the inside. I fly out there, and obviously the world has changed, and I think I'm going to reflect this in my art somehow. So I do a big mural of uh, pigs dressed as uh, fox hunters riding the symbols of England and hunting a man, and I think I'm very clever. But outside, London is starting to riot, because the Tories have just cut uh, free education, used to be free, mostly free, even to go to Oxford or Cambridge, or at least only a few thousand pounds, you know, affordable, class mobility, they'd cut that. And so students responded by going to the Tory headquarters and smashing it into a bunch of glitter and glass with their hands. Outside, the cops were kettling the students. The students were marching. People were getting arrested. A guy named Alfie Meadows got his head bashed in and was put into a coma. And there I was, painting this shit on these walls and thinking I was so clever for having an in-joke that no one would even see because it was too dark and people were too drunk to notice what was on a wall up a stairway that they're staggering to towards another goal. And I thought, what am I doing here? What am I doing? Which side am I on? And that's that moment, that moment where that little voice knocks you, knocks you on the shoulder, it punches you in the face even sometimes, and it says something to you. It says, this this thing, this life you've constructed, this dream you had, this thing that was so beautiful and perhaps made you uneasy but that you worked and fought for so hard, this cardboard diorama box, it's not paradise. It's just cardboard and paper mache and Lagalu's leg just fell off and this is not even particularly well made. The voice says to you, hey Molly, this isn't you, not anymore. Thanks.